Hello, welcome back. Today we will be thinking about the relationship between health insurance and markets. Specifically, we will take a look at the ethics of using market mechanisms to allocate healthcare insurance. And in the process, we will also familiarize ourselves with some basic ideas in the economics of insurance, and then look at how the insurance market actually functions in the United States. So let's get started. It is probably not controversial at all to say that markets are the most important social institutions of our time. So market language, such as terms like social capital, right, or market values, such as uh, can be seen from the phrase, time is money, uh, market language seems to have permeated every aspect of our lives. So in our time, uh, markets are also widely presumed to be the best mechanisms for the delivery of all forms of goods and services. Sometimes markets are pitted against other social institutions that seek to impose limits or to limit its scope, such as governments and other sorts of uh, institutions, such as religious organizations. However, to pit market against other kinds of institutions is not very clarifying, because markets are themselves created by laws, policies, as well as social norms. For instance, the buying and selling of human life are almost universally condemned. Right? Uh, and the selling and the purchasing of human organs or sexual services are still considered to be extremely controversial. So policies not only determine what can or cannot be sold or done in the marketplace, but also determine the shape of the market by creating rules that govern, uh, that govern the market as well as creating the legal conditions for the existence of certain market entities such as corporations, and you know hospitals and so on. So what is really at issue in discussions about markets hinges on moral questions about whether it is appropriate to use markets for certain ends and whether the scope of market uh, in certain contexts uh, is actually appropriate. So today uh, markets are often presumed to be the best way of allocating the good of health insurance. There are several reasons that are offered for this uh, by economists. Uh, among them is the idea that insurance markets create allocative efficiency. Now, what is allocative efficiency? It basically means that the allocation of scarce resources in our economy uh, is able to satisfy a maximal level of various wants and needs. In addition, though, uh, the market competition that is encouraged by these various market demands could also lead to the best products at the lowest prices. Uh, and this, of course, is going to lead to the most efficient use of our productive resources. This latter idea is called productive, uh, productive efficiency. So in short, markets uh, help get the most desirable products to the people who want them uh, at the lowest prices. So when more people can get what they want, right, uh, we increase what utilitarians would call ag uh, aggregative social utility. This is one of the goals of utilitarianism, which is to maximize uh, our ability to have our preferences met. But markets are on utilitarian grounds alone, valued for instrumental reasons. That is to say, markets help us to achieve certain ends, but are not valued in itself. So markets, uh, for instance, can lead to allocative efficiency, which leads to productive efficiency, and that is the reason why utilitarians value markets. But there are also non-utilitarian arguments defending uh, markets not only as an instrumental good, but as a good um, in itself. So non-utilitarians such as libertarians might argue that markets in fact maximize individual choice, and so the, thus are valued uh, for it in itself, right? So libertarians might be said to value markets as an intrinsic good, and not just an instrumental good. Markets obviously have a lot of things going for it, but there are also many criticisms against markets. Marx is perhaps one of the most famous historical examples of one who criticized market systems. He pointed out that in the marketplace, those with the most economic power will also have the most overwhelming power over the fate of others, uh, be it in the workplace or uh, other social institutions such as political institutions. Now, what, one example of this is the global race to the bottom to find cheap labor, as many companies in the United States 
compete to outsource uh, to other countries with a cheaper labor force. So this, at the end, pits the interest of domestic workers uh, against those of the interest of corporations. So domestic workers, however, because of this dynamic, are often left in the dust uh, as entire industries move overseas, right? So another example of the existence of oligopolies, which both distort uh, prices as well as hold many consumers hostage to very bad goods and services. Now, this dynamic, of course, can lead to further concentration of wealth and power. Now, but, but this idea is really not unique to Marx, because Adam Smith has also made this more or less the same observations in Wealth of Nations. He commented that powerful producers and companies can also seek to manipulate the regulatory system to their own benefit um, against the interest of consumers and average people. Um, however, a lot of, including, a lot of critics, including Marx, believe that the concentration of power is inherent to micro market dynamics itself if it is left on its own. So the same thing also worried uh, another political philosopher, Jean-Jacques Rousseau. He was concerned that as technology improves, the need for a a specialized kinds of knowledge will continue to also worsen inequalities. Today, we kind of see this dy dynamic play out between the working class and the professional class, uh, which also explains some of the polarization that we're seeing today. Right. Uh, so. Nonetheless, Rousseau didn't completely give up on markets because, as like many others, they believe that good economic policy can actually mitigate some of the volatility that is inherent to market mechanisms. There's also another line of moral criticism um, that basically says that markets have the tendency to distort human relationships. So, for instance, if human labor is a kind of commodity, then are human beings transformed from persons into mere cogs in an economic machine to be used and thrown away uh, when they're no longer useful, right? So this line of criticism sees the tendency of market logic uh, to also colonize other spheres of life to be very problematic. So some people, for instance, find the, for instance, the buying and selling of sexual services as well as reproductive services to be morally problematic. Others find the practice of, say, larger corporations going overseas and then leaving entire communities behind to be also morally problematic. For instance, in 2016, President Donald Trump uh, promised in his campaign to bring jobs back from overseas uh, is, is, is a kind of response right, to this concern of companies uh, leaving domestic workers behind. So here are some examples of what some people might consider to be morally problematic uh, in terms of uh, using market mechanisms in inappropriate ways. So the first example is a prison cell upgrade, right? $82 per night. In Santa Ana, California, and some other cities, uh, nonviolent offenders can pay for better accommodations in prisons, right? A clean, quiet jail away from the cells of uh, non-paying prisoners, for instance. Some people might find that very problematic. The second one is the services of an Indian surrogate mother to carry a pregnancy with a price, price tag of $6,250. Now, Western couples seeking uh, surrogates increasingly outsource the job to India, where the practice is legal, right, and the price is less than one-third of the going rate in the United States. And then lastly, admission of your child to prestigious universities. Al although the price is not posted, officials from top universities uh, say that they accept uh, some less than stellar students whose parents are wealthy and likely to make substantial financial contributions. So what do you think about these ways of using me market mechanisms in different spheres of life? So going back to Powers and Fadden, who are non-ideal uh, theorists of justice. Um, so what do they say? Well, they believe that whether markets should be endorsed or not would depend on empirical considerations of how particular markets actually work in a particular social setting. So Powers and Fan do not reject or accept markets as such in the abstract, but they encourage us to look at what markets do uh, to important dimensions of well-being uh, through how markets interact with all kinds of social determinants uh, of health, right, in particular, in a particular uh, context. Before moving on, however, it is important to take a look at how insurance markets are different from markets for other kinds of uh, consumer goods. 
The first thing to notice is that insurance markets might lead to what's called market failures. So in 1963, the economist Kenneth Arrow made very uh, influential arguments about uh, insurance markets that are still relevant today. Uh, he famously argued that markets can satisfy the efficiency requirement only if a number of conditions are met. Uh, two of them are relevant for us today. One, buyers and sellers must be able to evaluate the utility enhancing features of the goods and services available in the marketplace. That is to say, people who are buying and selling things must be able to know enough information about what they're buying and selling in order to be able to make rational decisions. However, if there is imperfect information or a lot of uncertainty about the utility to be derived from some of these goods and services, then the goal of trying to achieve efficiency through consumer choice would be severely undermined. Two, information that does exist about the utility enhancing features and price of all the goods and services has to be made available to all market participants. So insofar as there are substantial asymmetries between buyers and sellers in the distribution and the, in the distribution of information, then inefficiency are, are also introduced, right? So basically that information is paramount. Right to to know what we're getting, uh, and then to not be manipulated, say by sellers who are trying to get us to buy things, we should have access to a reasonable amount of information that is available to everyone. Otherwise, sellers, for instance, can try to ma manipulate buyers into buying things that they don't really need. Right, and if that happens, we also don't have market efficiency. So, insofar as market for a particular product lacks these conditions, uh, it could lead to market failures. So let's talk about uncertainty of utility in the healthcare market. The first thing to consider is that medical needs are highly episodic, variable, and unpredictable in terms of timing and severity. So imperfect information, as well as uncertainty, can distort consumer judgment about what kinds of goods and services they need in the healthcare market. Another thing to consider is that current health status is often not a very good predictor of future medical needs. The second thing to consider is the inelasticity of demand which means that for some goods and services, such as emergency health care, changes in prices do not really alter the demand. The need for goods and services cannot be substituted in these cases by cheaper alternatives, such as, you know, if you can buy an expensive house, you can buy a cheaper house, or if you can buy an expensive car, you can buy a cheaper one, or take the bus. In this case, uh, in terms of emergency health care, you really only have one option. Right? So this makes it very difficult to budget for future healthcare needs because of the inelasticity of demands. Next thing is catastrophic, and, um, catastrophic illness and injury. They're not really amenable to budgeting and can leave even the relatively affluent among us in financial ruin. Now this is worsened by the increasing cost of high-tech medicine, as well as how new technologies also int introduce new uncertainties. So even if insurance coverage increased over time in the history of the United States, people are still spending more and more of their income uh, in terms of health care. The elderly, for instance, can spend up to 50%, half of their income on health care in the late 1990s alone. And the last thing is the variability of prognosis. Diseases in different people differ in terms of severity, complications, stages, uh, as well as how people respond to treatment and as well as comorbidities uh, um, that can deepen uncertainty. So let's talk about asymmetry of knowledge in healthcare. Now, as we all know, uh, reliance on experts is one of the defining features of healthcare. So patients rely on professional knowledge, uh, professional judgment, as well as uh, healthcare professionals' fiduciary integrity, right? Namely, healthcare professionals have to uh, fight for the interests of their patients in order to determine medical needs and treatments. So this makes healthcare goods and services what's called credence goods, right? Goods that depend on experts. The internet, for instance, these days, um, a lot of people may think that this makes things better, right? Uh, but actually, it could also make things worse, as patients often lack the ability to determine what is credible and uh, non-credible information. So that these, uh, this thing leads to patients being unable to really maximize utility in terms of health um, without already having some kind of access to basic healthcare goods and services, namely the expertise of medical providers. So because of the inherent tendency for insurance markets to head towards failure, modern economics often have to choose between two ways of designing healthcare markets. 
One is to remove some allocation decisions from the market and give them to sort of a, a third institution, such as governments, right, to allocate healthcare. Two is to continue to use market uh, private markets, but use regulations to mitigate the potential of market failure. So uncertainty in healthcare makes it almost impossible for individuals to determine the right mix of insurance coverage. So it naturally then inherits basically the uncertainty of healthcare itself, right? But it, well, but insurance in a lot of ways really is just, is the response to that, right? Insurance is a way for people to pull resources together in order to take care of those risks, and it's it's by it's 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 to mitigate the risk by sharing our varied risks. So let's take a look at some forms of uh, health insurance now, under what's called indemnity insurance. Insurers would provide either partial or full compensation to independent healthcare providers after some deductibles are met. The other kind is uh, managed care plans, which is like HMOs. Right? So insurance would contract with phys physicians and providers within a network in, uh, to provide healthcare to individuals. Typically, though, HMOs require a primary physician to also refer patients to specialized services. We'll talk about this later. Uh, which is one way of controlling co controlling cost. So, but neither insurance scheme really can really en enable insurance to to plan for the unknown, right? So there's really no difference in terms of how these two manage risk. But precisely because insurance is about risk sharing, two questions are naturally raised: How should we determine the composition of the risk sharing pool? Right? Who should be part of the risk sharing pool? And then secondly, what goods and services require risk, sh uh, risk sharing, right? So these two questions bring up two more types of market failures to the, service, uh, to the surface, namely adverse selection and moral hazard. So after the Second World War in the United States, health insurance was really tied to employment as a benefit, right? So by the 1960s, individual, purchases, uh, in, individual purchasers of insurance became very rare. So until the 1960s, the nonprofit risk-sharing pool uh, was really based on communities and was very broad-based, right? So, who pe so people who have a higher risk um, as well as those with low risk share the same pool within the same communities and also share the same dues. But after World War II, things shifted towards uh, for-profit experience-based insurance schemes. So firms are uh, charged a uh, certain premium based on its claim history, right? So th this kind of for-profit scheme then enabled firms with lower claims, right, people who are not as likely to use healthcare services to withdraw from community schemes in order to reduce premiums, right? leaving the very high-risk people in the nonprofit scheme to bear the burden of their increased costs. And this led to the eventual collapse of the nonprofit model of insurance in the United States. So the for-profit model is based on the idea of actuarial fairness. This means that uh, people who, are, who have like risk are treated alike. And so the people who are lower risk no longer share the same pool as those who have higher risk. So insurance companies try to assess the risk level of a particular firm and then try to charge uh, group rates that are consistent with the risk level that that group represents. So here you can see risk is no longer broadly shared as in the older community model. So traditional risk pooling is rejected by this model uh, because they're seen as a kind of forced subsidy by the healthy to the less healthy. However, interestingly, I think, this way of putting things um, is, is ironic because if risk sharing is really the purpose of insurance uh, because of the inherent uncertainty of healthcare needs, then failing to really broadly share risk would be to really undermine the intended purpose of insurance in the first place. But it doesn't matter how narrowly groups are de de determined or defined. It is always going to be made up of people with very heterogeneous risk, very different risk. So being part of a firm, for instance, does not really guarantee that you would have the same risk as other people in the same firm. So every insurance scheme in one way or another, it potentially subsidizes uh, those who have higher risk. So the limited information if, uh, insurance companies have about individuals 
also mean that individuals who know themselves to be of higher risk are incentivized in this for-profit model to, to join groups that have lower average risk in order to pay cheaper premium. This is sometimes called adverse selection because it is a uh, it has a negative impact on those who supposedly have a lower risk. But then, hey, again, who knows what your actual risk level is? So adverse selection uh, really pits less healthy individuals against the interest of health insurance companies, as, as, he as health insurance companies have a great incentive to search for people who represent low risk, right, and to have lower risk enrollees. Uh, this leads to another problem in health insurance market that is called moral hazard. It means that when a person's behavior is changed by the very fact of having health insurance coverage, uh, in such a way that having insurance actually stimulates demand for healthcare services that are not really beneficial for health, then this also undermines allocative efficiency, right? So the problem is related to, again, the scope of the insurance coverage in the, in the United States. So in the 1950s, insurance covered only hospital stays. So routine visits and prescription drugs were not covered. Uh, I think prescription drugs were covered only in the 1990s. So the coverage of health insurance has increased in scope, right, as a result of tax policy and, and so on, but also as a response to the increasing cost of health care as well as technological advances. So, but such expansions of scope also led to um, less coverage, though, for catastrophic and high-cost medical care um, and led to more coverage for things like routine visits. So in other words, insurance has become a lot shallower than it used to be. But then the coverage of very shallow healthcare policies are then criticized as over-insurance. As more people make use of these basic medical services, that really do not necessarily lead to a net benefit of health for society at large. So insurance, uh, insurance companies are then worried about over-utilization because it undermines their profit, profit. And economists, on the other hand, are worried about the loss of allocative efficiency. So put together more hazard, right, with the general ethos of beneficence in healthcare. Uh, a lot of people point out overutilization is really the, the normal way things go in healthcare, right? Uh, because health, healthcare providers want people to be healthy, so they want them to uh, get checks up whenever possible. So they would encourage them to make use of certain services. So those uh, these potential market uh, failures lead to has led to in our time, various cost saving as well as um, risk avoiding strategies. And we'll take a look at that. So one way of saving money uh, is pr pricing strategies. So basically you price premiums according to the risk uh, that group or individual po pose as much as possible. However, this is inherently difficult even without legal restrictions uh, because to know that someone's risk level would require so much work and investigation, of, and, and, and which would lead to higher administrative costs, to the point that uh, the cost that you would incur for making a decision about somebody's risk level is going to outstrip the money you would save from having a more accurately assessed underwriting process. So the other easy strategy is to ex exclusionary underwriting. Right. So this strategy simply excludes uh, people who pose higher risk from getting insurance at all. So this happened when the community model shifted, as, as I said before, uh, into the experience model of underwriting. So then after that shift took place, redlining started to take place for employees and industries that, uh, that were deemed higher, uh, higher risk by insurance companies. Uh, and this is basically still common practice in a lot of places. Right. So this turned the prevailing market wisdom upside down because as the supply of insurance dwindled, actually as demand increased, the more people need insurance, the less people are actually able to find products of any kind uh, that is good, that is you know appropriate for them. So for instance, in 1960s, private insurers stopped really selling insurance to the elderly altogether. Now one plausible explanation for this is that Without a broad-based risk sharing, 
the actual premiums of insurance for high-risk populations, such as the elderly, will actually rise so high that it would be virtually impossible for that population to actually afford. So exclusionary underwriting was one of the reasons behind the establishment of Medicare in the 1960s. So insurance actually uh, prefer, right, rationally younger and healthier enrollees. Uh, so, they, so then the elderly are just priced out of the market uh, completely. So the other problem of the insurance market is consumer choice itself. Because consumer choice can lead to adverse selection as well as death spirals. So, for instance, when a generous insurance policy appears on the market, right, it is really worth more to those who have higher health risks. So a larger share of people who purchase this policy would be people who are going to be in the high, higher risk uh, level. So then that leads to, over time, the increase of premiums. Uh, more and more people who, are, who hold this policy uh, are using healthcare services. Then, after a while, the lower risk people who don't use healthcare services that much would either try to buy a cheaper plan or to exit the insurance market altogether. And this would then further increase the premium of the original plan. Eventually, this will continue to happen until, uh, until only the high-risk population remains in this insurance plan and would be virtually uninsurable, right? And then they will be driven out of the insurance market altogether. So consumer choice in the insurance market uh, guarantees that high-risk people are, are and the, you know, high-risk people like elderly would be priced out of the market without some kind of public intervention, either by providing a public option or by limiting the reasons an insurance can exclude people. So this leads to supply-side strategies, which is another way of controlling cost, right? Uh, so the supply, one of the supply-side strategies is to use primary physicians and providers as gatekeepers, such as in HMOs. In this case, physicians are required to follow insurance guidelines, on what is or isn't a legitimate reason to use a particular uh, specialized service. So this, this approach, though, fell out of favor as competition between managed care plans never really materialized, and we'll talk about that uh, why later. But one benefit of having really fewer insurers is that insurers would have more bargaining power over providers, right? So if your insurance company have a lot of enrollees, and you have a lot of enrollees because the enrollees don't really have a lot of option then that means you will have a lot of people within your insurance using the healthcare services to be able to negotiate a better price for your insurance uh, scheme, right? Um, so having bargaining power over providers is one of the benefits of having very few insurers in competition with each other. But if there are many uh, insurance on the other hand, then they would have less bargaining power, leaving, leading to more expensive healthcare costs. So in this case, having more competition between insurance companies is not necessarily a good thing, right? So this is why uh, the industrial purchase model often favors less consumer choice and tries to limit it. So in addition, though, physicians also do not like to be gatekeepers, right? They don't like to be told by insurance company what to do, what they can tell their patients. Instead of telling patients you can't have this, they would rather say your insurance doesn't cover it. The next one is the uh, demand side strategies. So since supply side strategies are not as successful as we expected, insurance now favors a combination of both supply and demand side strategies. Basically by uh, raising co-payments, uh, deductibles, and then try to uh, successfully curb utilization through other means. So this seems to be preferred by many as a better alternative than either outright exclusion or to try to control physicians' behavior, uh, or to incur the cost of trying to make more accurate risk assessments. So there are also downsides with this, of course, because it assumes that the asymmetry of information is not as serious, um, since consumers are really forced to, a lot of times, make uh, uninformed decisions about healthcare, which might lead to uh, worse health outcomes. So the burden of demand side strategies then also falls disproportionately on the poor and the underprivileged, uh, especially poor and uninsured children who really cannot bear the burden of higher deductibles and premiums as a result of these uh, demand side strategies. So despite the claim that Americans are overinsured because of these shallow schemes, 
Uh, actually, we don't really have any way to determine whether or not this is true based on the lack of data in terms of outcome. Research does show that there are serious gaps um, in, in terms of healthcare needs and the healthcare that is actually received. There's also evidence that delayed care leads to very serious illnesses down the road, which is going to become more expensive. So when children, for instance, fail to receive the care they need, the consequences could be catastrophic, both as, for children as individuals as a society. Powers and Fadden believe that both overinsurance and underinsurance are true. Uh, but they really describe people who belong to different social classes, right? So while people who belong to the upper or upper middle class uh, may not be harmed by demand side strategies, right? Uh, maybe they also actually overutilize healthcare services. The poor and the people with low socioeconomic status may actually suffer from the effect of what's called the negative portfolio effect. Basically, this is saying the same thing as multiple cascading social determinants, negative cascading uh, social determinants combining to create um, uh, disadvantages. So the poor have no access to affordable insurance um, or losing coverage could only you know, worsen an already bad situation. So the way the um, employment-based insurance system is structured actually makes matter, matters worse in the United States. We have already seen that how redlining can actually exclude entire industries or populations from being able to access health insurance. So people who need health care the most are basically excluded from the insurance market, as many employers are unable to find plans that would allow them to enroll, right? Even when they do, they, even, they often have to pay a much higher premium right, to the point that they have to give up half of their income to have health, health insurance. Since um, health insurance is group-based in the United States, those who don't belong to a group, uh, an insurable group, are underwritten based on their individual risks. And so do not really have the benefit of risk sharing with a large group of people who have bargaining power over uh, providers. So in other words, they really lack a large scale purchasing alliance. Now this, the people who belong in this group of not uh, being able to belong to any insuring, uh, insurance groups is predominantly African American and Latino. So, meaning that those who are more likely to suffer from employment or discrimination are also more likely to be excluded from insurance. The Fortune 500 companies, however, on the other hand, um, not only offer better wages, but also offer superior health insurance because they have a large pool and so have a lower risk. And then also um, have a lower risk because of the social status of the people who are in these plans. They also have actually lower administrative overhead costs, right, which is about 5% versus 20% for small firms. Uh, but also because they have, uh, they're cheaper because they also have bargaining power because of being an economy of scale, right? So smaller employers are this, uh, small employers are this charge a higher premium for the same coverage as other larger companies. So larger groups have better financial security and are also secured from financial ruin from health risk. Smaller groups, on the other hand, especially groups that are deemed of higher risk, have less financial security, not only from their jobs, uh, but also have to now deal with the added risk of not having insurance that would cover uh, it enough to, to defend against uh, catastrophic financial risks. In addition, though, large employers that provide insurance to employees are also publicly subsidized so while those who lack employment health benefits are not subsidized, so subsidy benefits those who are already fortunate, in other words, in our economy. So those with higher socioeconomic status um, at about uh, 124 to $145 billion a year in tax subsidies. Those with the highest salaries get the highest tax subsidies. This is directly opposite of how other nations subsidize for health insurance. Here, if you make $100,000, you get about $2,350 in tax break. Well, if you only make $15,000, you get seventy-one. dollars So in short, when it comes to health insurance in the United States, the disadvantage among the employed suffer the most from health risk. The employment-based system also favors larger industries. So the dominance of the demand-side strategies actually makes the poor people's situation worse off, right? 
as the majority of the tax break goes to the wealthy. There are also other accompanying problems in the insurance marketplace. For instance, uh, Medicaid actually doesn't keep pace with the increasing cost of healthcare, as very low payments for services uh, discourages uh, providers from taking on Medicaid patients. And then on top of that, Medicaid only covers about uh, two-thirds of the poor. And then we have age-based market segregation because of redlining, right? So the insurance, the insurance pool uh, makes the healthcare system unable to really care for people responsibly over their entire lifespan, right? As private insurance enroll more younger people and then later on dump older people onto uh, the Medicare programs. So then not a lot of investment is actually made to ensure long-term health for the population, right? So that's one problem with age segregation. And then the other problem is, of course, the employment-based insurance raises the other issue of if you don't have a job. Right? The, the fluid labor market, as it increasingly becomes the case, a lot of people are in between jobs. Right? And so they have a huge gap in their health insurance coverage. And a lot of things can happen uh, when people lose their jobs or even just change jobs. Um, illness happens and things happen during that time that can lead people to uh, catastrophic health and financial ruin. Um, and then maybe even later on to higher premiums because of those experiences. So administrative burdens uh, that are imposed on the public system uh, kind of meeting the gap also make it very extremely difficult, right, for people to enroll during those periods of gaps, uh, especially true for poor children, right? So developing children are those, as well as those who have chronic illness, have worse uh, and more costly outcomes as a result of being in those gaps. Those who are too young to retire early, such as those who are between 65 and 67, but are too frail to continue to work, also have to choose to sacrifice their health in order to keep their employment-based health insurance. But there are also other moral considerations about the insurance system, reasoning and respect. As we have seen, gaps in healthcare can severely impact uh, poor children whose cognitive development and overall health require consistent monitoring as well as early interventions. As people get older, uh, the ability to make healthy life plans also require uh, consistent interactions with primary care, right? Uh, they need education. Um, they need to figure out how to live healthy lives. With, so if, without affordable uh, access to health care, the emotional, psychological, and relational burdens are worsened as people's ability to care for themselves and for others are reduced. And this chain of causes then could lead from lack of access to health care to undermining self-respect and self-determination. So parents, for instance, who feel helpless when their children are in need really feel the sting of their social position the, the strongest, right? Their inability to help their loved ones also undermine their sense of agency and self-respect. And this is all the more magnified when social safety net programs impose very heavy administrative burdens on the poor in order for them to get help. Burden that, burdens that other society usually don't have to bear at all. Already disadvantaged, many of the working poor are required to fill out, for instance, very long applications, right, that require very invasive private information that could further undermine their self-respect. Now, the effects of having to reveal things about yourself that other people haven't earned the right to know uh, is, really, is really not a good reason for being humiliated, right? So, so, for instance, food supplement AIDS applications, as recently pointed out by uh, Congresswoman Katie Porter, actually require more invasive personal information than a, than a member of Congress is required to disclose upon taking office. So this state of affairs will be considered quite unjust from the perspective of powers and fat. So that is all I have for today. Uh, hopefully this session has brought some clarity into what are some of the ethical issues that are raised by um, the health insurance market, especially in the United States.